Welcome to the all new Empowered to Lead vlog series. This is episode number two. Uh, my name is Derek Butler and I'm excited to engage with you as we empower you to be the education leader of equity, access, and diversity in your schools and districts. Uh, over the last few years, we've dedicated this virtual and vlog professional learning space to uh, fostering excellence in innovation and equity leadership. Uh, we produce the Closing Gaps by Opening Spaces vlog series where we discuss first the leader mind shift in this work, uh, developing a, a growth mindset. Uh, then we produce the leader fit vlog series where we discuss the practical leader moves to prioritize and work on the work, uh, developing those leadership muscles, if you will. Well, in this new vlog series, we will embark upon a journey of introspection, reflection, uh, and empower you to be uh, to, to really engage in the practice of self-awareness. In short, my goal is to challenge you to be a leader that is metacognitive because leadership begins from within. Uh, so if you're ready to examine your thinking, your learning, uh, and engage as a reflective practitioner about your role in leading equity, access, and diversity, then let's jump right into our conversation. We're on the air. So I, I recently read an article in Forbes magazine uh, titled, The Soft Stuff is the Hardest, Meaning How People Work Together. And essentially this article uh, is about how we as leaders uh, leverage people for organizational improvement. Uh, the author of this article, Deborah Lovitch, who is a consultant for several Fortune 500 companies, quips about this idea uh, that strategy and operations is often considered the the hard stuff is and, and is therefore relegated for the sharpest of minds in the organization. Uh, but but really the reflective moment um, uh, captured in this article for me was really that the work that we do as leaders relative to the engagement of people, uh, which is perceived sometimes as the soft stuff, is really the super lever for impactful change. Uh, this prompted me to uh, reflect on my experiences as a leader. Uh, and how I may have utilized the old uh, will and skill approach of changing behaviors. Uh, but the times when I had to uh, leverage the organizational supports and structures um, to affect behaviors as well. And, and here's a moment of vulnerability. Um, as I reflect on, on some of my most challenging uh, leadership moments and decisions, uh, I found that those decisions had tremendous implications for really a diverse group of stakeholders. And it was not always filtered through uh, an equity and access perspective. And so, you know, here's what I want you to do. As you reflect on your impact in this episode, I also want you to reflect on the value and influence of the people who are on this journey with you, the collaborative network that collectively fuels this work of equity, access, and diversity. And as you do that, consider all of your students but in particular, your students with disabilities. And of course, while I'm not going to, um, you know, put you on the hot seat, um, uh, I, I am going to put you on ice. And remember, ice is the equity lens from which I want you to examine your thinking. Uh, and in this episode, I will invite you to examine your thinking about the influence of the collaborative network and its subsequent impact on our most marginalized and underserved students in classrooms. So. Before we do all of that, uh, let's talk about the collaborative network. And let's take a step back to review and connect the driver in our Lead Embrace framework that supports instructional excellence. You may remember that as the targeted times to engage in thorough talks, how we leverage collaborative planning, professional learning communities for our teachers, uh, the intentionality in which we structure the time and conversation that leads to meaningful dialogue, and that's designed to your results. And then I want you to think about uh, the design in our Lead Embrace framework uh, that sustains instructional excellence, uh, building capacity for uh, heads and leads. You may remember from our first vlog series, uh, this is about putting the right individuals in the right place, 
positioning them to be impactful, uh, preparing them to lead the way. Uh, but, you know, this could also be about you uh, pruning your very own leadership for growth through the influence of others. And so um, I, I think I want you to go ahead and put your warm thinking and reflective caps on because here's the ice. Right? First, identify who, who are the stakeholders in your network that support and sustain uh, an inclusive environment for students with disabilities. Um, this seems easy, right? Well, as you reflect on the collaboration with staff, parents, community partners, and your own support structures, mentors, coaches, whomever, supervisors, I want you to identify the key areas uh, of strength and areas of growth within these partnerships or structures. How can that insight inform your approach to better support students with disabilities? Uh, how can this network have an even more direct impact on creating a more equitable and accessible learning environment for these students? I'll give my one example um, as a model for your reflective thinking, okay? So for me as a leader, it was transformative to have a thought partner and coach come alongside me as an extension of my network. Uh, yes, as a leader, I was doing the things to ensure our teachers, leaders, and staff were engaged in the work uh, and our uh, structures were being refined uh, to allow uh, staff and teachers the opportunity to collaborate. But this was a, an opportunity for me to prune my leadership. This was a pruning leadership moment for me because there were some things that needed to be removed from my leadership mind, from my leadership mindset uh, that would allow me to uh, ultimately learn and grow. Uh, this was truly leveraging and diversify my collaborative network. Now, I want you to think about the impact. Now that you've identified uh, the collaborative structures or the network partnerships in your school or district that impact uh, students with disabilities, how do you measure for effectiveness? So perhaps you might start with examining the impact of your site-based collaborative structures or uh, partnerships on student outcomes uh, and the real or perceived uh, equity access culture in your school or district. How can you use this assessment and this data to identify effective strategies that could be implemented more broadly across your school uh, to impact students even more? I think about the pilot approach uh, to many of the practices that we often implement in schools and districts. Uh, more specifically, I think about the lift uh, required uh, to really strengthen the collaboration of co-teaching teams and, and engage them in intentional conversations, right? That targeted time that we talked about around those shared teaching practices and, and meeting the various needs of students whom they serve, uh, which is something as a leader, uh, coach, and consultant, uh, that I get to do very often. I was coaching a school leader recently and, and his goal was to improve um, the collaboration of his grade level co-teaching teams. He decided that in order to really assess the impact, he needed to go slow to go fast. And he wanted to really focus on the collaboration at a particular grade level first. Uh, his way of thinking was that uh, he really wanted to invest time in the thing that could potentially be most impactful, develop that, and a successful scale uh, for implementation. So let's go a little deeper and reflect on how we cultivate and create. So how can you cultivate a culture of empathy within your school or district that empowers all staff members to participate and contribute to and consider the support of students with disabilities, ensuring that these efforts align with, again, a broader goals of equity and access for other groups of students. Are you able to embed this as a, as a top line and through line of the day-to-day -day work? Then I want you to reflect on um, your collaborative efforts uh, with parents and community partners. Um, uh, and maybe even your your support structures, your mentors, your coaches, et cetera. Uh, what innovative or even 
let's say practical strategies can you create to strengthen these partnerships and enhance the support network available for students with disabilities, ensuring that all voices are heard and valued in shaping the learning experience. So as I sat in this, I I think about the parent partnership because for some, it can be the most uncomfortable uh, to lead for many reasons. Uh, However, the parent collaborative network is also considered the most important and the most influential. Uh, For me, quite frankly, uh, I sat in this reflective moment, uh, and this is really the BR part of what we talk about in our work with schools. It starts with building relationships. Now, consider the barriers that may inadvertently compromise the risk of service to students with disabilities in the teaching and learning space, whether that's time, resources, strategies, and beliefs. What specific steps can you take to eliminate these obstacles or otherwise prioritize the uh, ethos of collaboration as a way to intentionally compensate for the equitable learning experience for all students. So think about that. Lastly, I want you to reflect on the engagement of students. Um, How can you more effectively engage your students with disabilities to incorporate their insights and experiences into the decision-making process Uh, ensuring that uh, the strategies and interventions are truly responsive to their needs and aspirations, uh, while also reflecting on how this engagement influences your leadership and the school's collaborative culture. Listen, don't forget who you are as a leader. Uh, Don't forget who is on this journey with you and how you can leverage those partnerships as you make informed decisions that influence and shape the work of equity, access, and diversity in your space. You know, to pause for a moment uh, to engage in intentional reflective practices around this work is essential. Uh, So again, if you reflect at the end of the day or journal at the end of the week, I encourage you to continue taking a few moments to self-reflect because it matters. Um, You know, I share all the time Research has shown that only 10 to 30 percent of us engage in self-awareness. But remember, the more ref- this is the more reflective you are, the more effective you are. Looking inward before looking outward is critical. This, I'm confident that uh, your investment in this leadership will refuel you. Uh, it will lead to shifts in your practices and it will result in successful student outcomes. So thank you for joining me and for being a thought partner as we reflect and deepen our learning of how we are uniquely positioned and empowered to lead the work of equity, access, and diversity.